All right. Well, with that said, we'll get into our message this morning. We're talking about, we're calling it the series uh, Kingdom Come. We're looking through the Beatitudes. We'll get into our reading right away in Matthew chapter 5, if you want to begin looking there. We'll also put it up on the screen for those of you that want that help. That's fine. But before we read the, our scripture, I thought, well, you know, it's a Sunday. Why don't I bring some humor for you this morning? So I found this story about a man that walked into a coffee shop, and he said to the lady at the counter, I see you have Wi-Fi. Can you tell me the password? And the clerk behind the counter says, you need to buy a drink first. He says, okay, well, I'll have a Coke. She said, well, we, sorry, we don't have Coke. We have Pepsi. Is that okay? Okay, that's fine. How much is a Pepsi? She said, it's $3. So he bought the Pepsi, handed her the money, and he says, well, there you go. So now what's the Wi-Fi password? The lady behind the counter said, you need to buy a drink first. All spaces, lowercase. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they know how to get you, right? Okay. Matthew chapter 5, let's just begin with verse 1 again. I know we've been reading these same verses, and like last week, we'll try to take three of these Beatitudes and, and dissect them a little bit, understand what God has for us today. But uh, we'll just start with verse 1. Jesus, seeing the crowd went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, the disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And then our verse for today, verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. So today we're talking about mercy, the merciful, and what that means. And the Bible definition, if you will, is basically to be full of pity, to be kind, merciful, to be compassionate, or to show forgiveness, especially in a sense where somebody has reason to hold power or authority over another. But instead of using or activating that power, instead of bringing punishment, instead of bringing what someone deserves, you show forgiveness and compassion instead. It is love that responds to human need in unexpected and unmerited ways. And the Bible said, what we just read, is that we need to show mercy to others. It says, uh, if you or blessed are those who show mercy those who are merciful. Remember our word blessed means to be happy or happiness. Or happiness is those that show mercy to others. And we're commanded to do so. Um, and what's interesting is that this beatitude is the only beatitude that has a reaping and sowing characteristic to it. All the other beatitudes are kind of more along the lines of an investment reward trade. So if you give this, then you'll get something else in return, right? If you give, uh, uh, if you hunger and thirst for righteousness, then God will fill you up. If you mourn, then you'll be comforted. And so whatever you're going through, whatever attitude you have or whatever situation, if you deal with that, then God is going to do something different in your life. But this one has a reaping and sowing characteristic. If you sow the attitude of mercy... You reap an attitude of mercy. You receive mercy from others because you show mercy to it. This attitude says you get what, what you give. How you treat other people is a measure oftentimes by which they tend to treat you. You treat others well, they will treat you well in return. If you fill your life with people that you can be joyful around and you can extend uh, uh, reward with and kindness and you, you're a person that shows mercy and compassion and kindness to others, you receive it back in life. Um... Uh, this is why I'm going to go off my notes and probably get in trouble for it. 
But yeah, I've mentioned, I've kind of let you walk through a little bit of our journey. Personally, my, uh, my wife's mother passed away in January, and now we're right there at the planning of my father's in-law's funeral as well. And uh, he hasn't passed away yet, but he's just really weak, and so it's just kind of this back-to-back thing that's been really difficult couple of months. And so when we did her mother's funeral here, Um, And she was a person that was just kind, loved everybody she met. She was fun. She was funny. And she really cared. She truly loved and cared about other people. And she just invested in them. She always was at, you know, what we were doing. What are the kids doing? What's happening? What's going on in your life? Uh, Her kids would call her every single day just to talk about life and what was going on. And this room, when we had that funeral, was full. I mean, front to back, it was packed. Now, unfortunately, as we're talking about her father, we're talking about a service, and what would that look like? And unfortunately, his life, and you know, it's the kind of thing you just don't want to say out loud, maybe we're not supposed to, but he's been rather selfish, to be honest. He's been gruff and unkind. And we've been asking, if we did a funeral, where should we do it, what should it look like? And, and you know what we've been saying is, I don't know that anybody would come. I mean, we look at his life, and I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not making a judgment call upon him. I'm not saying anything about him. We just honestly are asking the question. People might come because they love us. People might come because they support the family. But who would come for him? And he hasn't sown mercy with his life. And so now at the end of it, there's not a lot of mercy left over or returned. If you sow mercy, you receive mercy, the Bible says. The greatest way to understand that, as we understand that if we treat people well, they tend, and it's not a, uh, a, a guarantee here, I can't tell you that if you show mercy and kindness and forgiveness to everybody else, it's always going to come back to you, but they tend to do that. But, mo- but what we can understand and what we do recognize or what we should kind of hang our hat on, if you will, is that we need to show mercy to others because God has shown mercy to us. God has given us mercy. God has given us forgiveness. God has given us compassion and kindness. And we all know what we deserve in how we've acted, how we've lived, how we've treated him. What we deserve is his judgment, his punishment. But what he's given to us instead is his son and his death on the cross. It's our shame, it's our condemnation, it's our sin that put him there, but he took the penalty of sin. He laid down his life, even when we didn't deserve it, even when we weren't looking for it, even when we weren't even asking for it, he laid down his life for you and me. He showed mercy to us because it is his nature, it is his character, it is who God is and what he, has, what he does. He has shown mercy to us, and so we must in turn show mercy to others. If we want God's mercy, we must be willing to show mercy to others. Jesus, Jesus taught us to pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. As we learn how to forgive those that have wronged us, as we have learned how to forgive those who have sinned against us, then God will be merciful and show his forgiveness upon our sin. And I don't want to take this too far because if you do, it's it's really, you really start asking, how much is my forgiveness from God dependent upon my forgiveness to other people? If God treats me the way I treat others, What would I deserve? Thankfully, I receive much better. And so Jesus taught us to pray that way. The Bible talks often of this. And to recognize even that he has given us forgiveness of so much. He has crossed a chasm that we could not jump over. He has come down from heaven to live amongst us and do what we could never do for ourselves. He has shown mercy, not because we deserve it, because, but because he gave it. And so often we hold others in bondage to our anger, our hatred, our, our disgust, our disdain, waiting for them to shape up and then we'll show them mercy. 
Thank you, God, you didn't treat us that way. We are to show mercy. The language is repeated several times throughout the New Testament that if we want to be forgiven and shown mercy by God, then we must first be willing to show mercy to others. Okay, let's go to the next one, verse 8. It says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Again, we're just kind of trying to define each of these. The, the word pure, pure in heart, uh, is the idea of clean or unstained or guiltless. It's that be without blemish, to be without wrong. It's to be holy. And we tend to think of purity as an issue of holiness. We tend to think uh, a pure heart is someone who keeps the Ten Commandments. If a pure heart is somebody that does everything right, everything good, if you have a pure heart, you don't have hatred in it. If you have a pure heart, you don't have uh, adultery or lust issues. If you have a pure heart, you're honest, you're kind. If you have a pure heart, you honor your parents and so on. And so we tend to think of it that way, that that's what I do. But, but in its proper definition or its purest definition, the, the word pure here means without Add mixture. In other words, it means it's one thing and nothing else. It's singular in nature. There's only one thing there. To illustrate this, you and I have probably both gone to the grocery store to get some pure orange juice. Now, there's all kinds of different orange drinks. <laughs> That's right. I, uh, we'll get to that in a moment. Yep, we're going to let you know this. You know, you, you can get uh, crystal light and, and, and juices and, and mixtures, and they, but you can get pure orange juice. And when you read the label on pure orange juice, it says the ingredients are orange juice. That's it. Not from concentrate. It hasn't been dehydrated and rehydrated. It's just orange juice. Now, as everyone in the room needs to know, my favorite cookie in the world is orange, tang, and uh, white chocolate chip cookies. Delicious, delicious. <laughs> and uh, it's about the only way I drink orange juice, except another tip, if you want. I've been adding tang to pancake batter. That's really good, yeah. You take, you take pancake batter, you add a little tang with that, and uh, some white chocolate chips, and you make pancakes. Phenomenal. It's just fantastic. <laughs> Still do the maple, maple syrup. It's great. I'm telling you, just trust your pastor. I wouldn't lead you astray. But I do share this warning. If you read the label on the back of a Tang bottle, it's a little bit different. It says uh, there's a list of all chemicals and colors and, and dyes. And all. So, um, yeah, yeah, right. No, this is actually, this is great. It says, uh, uh, let's see, there, it says sugar, fructose, citric acid, that provides tartness, less than 2% natural flavor. <laughs> So, so there's an orange flavor in there. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh. Absorbing acid, maltrodexin or something, calcium phosphate, guar and xanthan gums, sodium acid, priophosphate, artificial color, yellow five, yellow six, apparently orange is the new yellow, and BHA, whatever that is. <laughs> so... Little difference between tang and pure orange juice. And that's the idea of a pure heart. The heart has a singular focus on God. Because the problem is, is we use our heart so often to pursue lots of things. We're looking for all kinds of artificial flavors and stimulants and resources and activities. We're looking for everything under the sun to fill our heart with the one thing that's supposed to be there or instead of the one thing. James says as much in chapter four, verse eight, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. A pure heart has a single desire, 
But God recognizes, and we should understand as well, we have a tendency to divide our heart towards lots of things and fill our heart with all kinds of desires under the sun. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. You should have a single, undivided heart to seek after God and the things of Him. That's why we're here. Not only this morning, hopefully we've come in this morning with a singular desire to meet with God. I want to worship the Lord. I want to pray to the Lord. I want to hear from the Lord. I want to learn from his word. I am here with the singular desire to meet with God. And then other things are going to happen. Maybe there'll be good donuts down the hall. Maybe the coffee will be hot. Maybe my friend will be here. Maybe the kids will have a fun time downstairs. Maybe somebody will take us out to lunch afterwards. I mean, whatever. There's all kinds of things that happen after that or with that. But the purpose of being here is to meet with God. And to seek Him. But not only just here in this time, in this hour, in this building, but in all of our life. The reason we're created is to seek after God. And to serve him alone. It's the most foundational question of all life that each one is seeking to answer. Why am I here? What am I to do? Why? What is my purpose? But as I said, everybody's trying to answer these divine questions with worldly answers. And we give our heart over to the pursuit of of all kinds of other things. Things that aren't bad, things that aren't wrong, things that aren't evil necessarily, some of them are. But so often we just try to define ourselves and find identity in, I'm a mom, I'm a mechanic, I'm a student, uh, I, I'm a dad, I'm a grandparent, I'm a Presbyterian, I'm a golfer, I'm a thinker, I'm a feeler. And we kind of define ourselves by all these worldly activities and all these worldly explanations. But when do we step back and say, you want to know who I am? Then I am a child of God. And it's a single purpose and focus of my life is to know him and to seek him and to serve him and do my master's bidding. Where do you give your time, your talents, and your treasure? Is it in the pursuit of worldly things or is it the pursuit of godly things? Ralph Waldo Emerson rather famously said, a man is what he thinks all day long. What consumes your thoughts? What do you want most? What is the desire of your heart? And are you hoping there's enough room in there for both that and God? Of course, we all have these other things. We wash the car, we fix the house, we go to work, we recreate, we play, we pay the bills, we hang out with friends and family, we raise the children. We do all those things, and they're all well and good. But Jesus is telling us, if you want happiness, if you want real joy, if you want to have the kind of life that you're intended to live, it was created for you, then make your life about pursuing God and seeking Him and having the only desire in your heart, a thirst for Jesus. And then all these other things shall be added unto you. What's interesting is this one, what you receive out of this, he says, if you have a pure heart, then you'll see God. I've had that conversation so many times that God seems so far away. Sometimes I feel so close to him, and other times I can't, it's like he, he's not even there. Sometimes I feel he's like right in the room. I worship, I praise, I, I sing the songs, and, and I'm giving him glory, and, and he can just, it, his presence is so thick in the room, you can almost taste it. And other times I go to church, and, and uh, it's like he's not, he, he slept in today. What's the difference? Why do we sometimes feel that he's right there and other times he's so distant? Why do sometimes it feels like we hear his voice so clearly and other times he seems so silent? Why is it that he sometimes just feels like he's right with me and other times he feels so far away? 
Well, I want to say that if we believe in an eternal, immutable, never-changing, wondrous, mighty, almighty Father, is it possible that it's not He that has changed? It's not Him who has moved. But instead, you no longer have a single heart, and you've let distractions take over. You've let per other pursuits get in the way. You're filling your heart again with old things, old habits, different desires. And I watch you here so often. Where's the desire of your heart? Okay, I think we've beat that horse to death. Let's move on. (laughs) Let's do the last one. Blessed are the peacemakers, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Peacemakers um, are not necessarily someone who's just kind of quiet. A peacemaker isn't just somebody that doesn't say anything or gets along with everybody or is kind-hearted and good-natured. A peacemaker is not necessarily somebody that just hides in the background and goes with the flow. But instead, a peacemaker, by definition, is somebody who actively and strategically makes peace. So it's not passivity here, but instead, it is quite the opposite. It's learning how to take action that brings about peace. So I want to talk about four ways that you can do that, four ways that you could be a peacemaker. As we think about how we do the work, the job of working towards bringing, helping to bring peace into the world. Number one, a peacemaker serves others. You can serve others. Jesus said in Luke 6, 35, 36, but love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great and you will be the sons of the most high. Sounds very much like this beatitude. For he is kind to the ungrateful, uh, for for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. So saying that God, is, God, God himself is actually kind and ungrateful to those that don't deserve it. He's kind, or excuse me, he's kind to the ungrateful and the evil. He's good to those. He's longing to bring everyone into repentance. He's longing to see everyone come to know him. And so God is saying even he treats others with compassion and kindness. Why? Because he's trying to bring peace into the world. He's trying to make peace in the world by serving others. And we're called to do the same thing. Some of the greatest ways that you can make an inroad with somebody else the way, greatest way you could bring peace into a situation, maybe there's conflict or tension or you're not getting along or something, is there a way that you can serve them? Is there a way that you can do something for them? Is there a way that you can somehow encourage or lift them up or help their load? One of the, I, I, we were just having this conversation the other day that um, one of the, maybe one of the most important things to learn about life is that hurting people hurt people. And that means when, when problems are going on in people's lives, they tend to lash out and take it out on other people, right? It's like you have a bad day at work and you go home and kick the dog. Is that kind of an idea? When everything's out of sorts, when you're struggling, you, you, we tend to take it out on others. And the, and the greater the pain, the greater the struggle and problems in our life, the greater our tendency to do that to people that we otherwise cherish or care about. And so... If we're waiting for people to straighten up and fix their attitude and get better and then I'll, I'll like them or I'll help them, we might have a long wait for a train that don't come. But sometimes we can serve people, build bridges, help, alleviate their suffering. Maybe there's something you can do to make peace in their life by serving somebody else and trying to repair something that's not peaceful at the moment. Number two, a second way you can do this, you can be a peacemaker if you speak in peace. Speak in peace. There's a way of talking to other people that brings peace or incites more division. You can either 
be a peacemaker by how you talk, and it's not only the words you say, but tone of voice and body language. It's all the things that go into communication. You can work to bring peace, or you can work to escalate problems. You can escalate or de-escalate by what you say, by how you say it, by how you interact with other people. Words are so important in how we get along as a people. And sometimes we need to speak into people's lives and help them find peace or help bring peace into a situation. Are you an encourager? Are you a builder up? Do you show love with your words? Do you talk to people and show that you care? And sometimes in life you find it's the simplest little thing. It can sometimes be the simplest little thing that makes everything all the better or everything all the worse? Do our words build up and encourage or do our words destroy and break down? Are you a person that uses your speech, your words to try to bring peace? Now to tag into that, this seems to fit together with this next one, is you can also work to solve conflicts. And I wanna say to you that the best leaders, and everybody here in the room is a leader in some way. You're a leader somewhere, whether it's in your family or, or at work or in the community or here in the church or in some other way. You all have leadership impact somewhere. And the best leaders solve more problems than they create. Now, I know some leaders that create as many problems as they go about trying to fix. Sometimes we elect them. But good leaders solve problems instead of creating new ones. Now, sometimes a good leader has to work on creating a problem. They, they address an issue. I'm going to get to that in just a minute. Sometimes we have to address solving conflict sometimes maybe means we deal with the problem. But recognize that good leaders, the best leaders, they know how to go, they, their work is to be careful about what they do. They're strategic about how they go about their business. They, they lead in a way that helps to solve issues and, and solve conflicts and not just kind of willy-nilly mowing over people in the process. So sometimes being a peacemaker requires that we address problems. Sometimes we have to stand up against wrongs. Sometimes we even fight against evil, as Donna mentioned, the 40 days of life. Sometimes to be a peacemaker, we have to go first. We have to work towards peace. We have to step out boldly and courageously. Sometimes we have to move towards solving a problem or an issue. We have to look at what the Bible says and how we can bring life back into agreement and alignment with what it says. There are times when it's completely appropriate to confront your brother or sister even. Or speak truth and love. Being a peacemaker sometimes means you go out and you really have to roll up your sleeves and do the work of making the peace. But I want us to think about it in two ways. For some of us, as we think about being a peacemaker, we need to be encouraged to do the hard things. Some of us let things slide, let it be swept under the rug, we ignore, we turn around, we go the other way, we avoid the conflict. For some of us, we need to be admonished to do the hard work of taking initiative, making strategic steps towards solving a problem, addressing an issue, confronting a conflict, or meeting with a friend. For some of us, for far too long and in far too many ways, we don't step into the conflict and we need the courage to do so with wisdom. For others of us, we need the encouragement to temper our reactions, to learn self-control as we see problems. Proverbs 15.1 says, a gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. Some people are quick to incite arguments, cynicism, criticisms, and confrontation. They're all too happy to run it head on into the next conflict with both barrels blazing. 
and they think that they're justified, even responsible to right the wrongs that they see around them. And for some of us, as we learn how to be better peacemakers, we need to learn how to do this work with wisdom and compassion and very likely realize that oftentimes we're servicing our own agenda all the while calling it God's. And so I don't know where you tend to be more often, but solving conflict is one of the greatest works that we can do. And both are required. This isn't an either or, and this isn't a carefully walk the line in the middle. This is a both and. We need to learn how to do both to be good peacemakers. Um, and the last one, the last way that you can be a peacemaker is to sh uh, share the gospel. Share the gospel. As we've been blessed in mercy and kindness and God's love has been shown to us, one of the greatest ways that we can be a peacemaker is to bring the same spiritual peace into the world by sharing that message. Jesus said that Christians should be known by their love. And the greatest way we can show love is by telling this message that we have found so much hope, so much comfort and meaning in. Now we're gonna close this morning. I wanna read a prayer for you and then we just, the worship team's gonna come back up and help us with a, a last song and just give you a, trying to give you a few moments here at the end just to respond. Where's your heart? Does any one of these speak to you that you need to be more merciful? Maybe there's a specific issue that comes to mind. Maybe you need to be a better peacemaker. You're going through some trial right now and you want God's wisdom and how to deal with it, handle it. What's the right response? You need his wisdom. Um, maybe it's something else. You know, these beatitudes, I don't know about you, but it seems like everyone, as I think about it, study it, look at it in my life, it just kind of hits me square between the eyes. What do you need to know and hear from the Lord today? So we'll do this. Um, I just want to read this prayer over you. It's uh, called the Prayer of St. Francis. And um, then Jen is going to come up and lead us in a prayer time while the worship team kind of leads us through a song at the end here. And this is one of those moments I know you're probably thinking about grabbing your purse and your coat and your, your, your stuff and, oh, lunch is calling my name. Careful about that divided heart. Take another five more minutes to spend time with the Lord and let him do a work in you. Would you stand as I read this prayer? Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me show, sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. And it is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Jenna, would you come as the worship team comes forward?